Um, today we want to talk about Blender for school age kids. Um, I'm curious, who's currently teaching Blender to young students, age 10 to 16? Nobody, okay, 16 to 20? Pre-university? I used to. You used to? Okay. Cool. Well, we're going to talk today about how to teach Blender to school age kids because the three of us have been doing that for a while. Um, who are we? I'll start with me and myself. I'm Monique. I am uh, half of AdMind, so I'm partially also developing on the Blender Compositor. And um, since this year, this year also set up a platform for teaching Blender to uh, young students which is called B3D 101. And here we have Tom. <laughs> so, okay, so I'm from 3D Ami, as is Pete, and we gave a talk about this last year. Um, we run a summer school, we're getting kids for seven days, and we make a complete film beginning to end. Um, and the kids are 14 to 18 year old, and I'm also a UCL researcher in graphics and stuff, yeah, whatever. Uh, okay, I, obviously, Peter, um, you can see how close these photos actually look like to us, it's, it's quite interesting. Um, so, I've been teaching Blender to school age kids since 2007, with the old interface, which was really, really nasty, um, and you're going to see some of our work, the work that we've been doing in the last couple of, um, well, a couple of years, coming up very shortly. So, I'll pass back to, next slide is Tom. Okay. Um, that's me. Have a button. No, we should give me the button. So... 3D Ami, I mentioned it just now. Um, it's sort of the, the sort of the big, the big thing which we do with students. And so it's a very large, complex event, takes a lot of resources to run. We get in 14 to 18 year olds, teams of nine to ten, and they make films, and it is complete. Script writing, um, storyboarding, they make everything, characters, sets, the works. Um, but what are the numbers? The, we, you know, our budget was last year quite big. This year was a bit smaller, but we still did three teams, this being our fifth year. And what I would say is I did give a talk last year. It's on YouTube if you're at the Blender conference. It's on YouTube if you want to see it. Um, so we're not really going to talk about um, 3D Ami any further. This is just saying this is where we come from. We're now going to focus on younger students. Yes. Um... Well, for two years, I've been uh, supporting quite some events in the Netherlands, and um, everybody was, uh, I, a lot of people and a lot of kids were screaming, ah, I want to learn Blender, I want to learn 3D. So um, I started this year just with a website uh, providing some free tutorials for kids to learn. And um, I've been supporting quite some events. Uh, together with Tom, we did uh, the Leeds event. And uh, this year, the Dutch Coder class kicked off, which is uh, a school that's going to teach uh, Blender for six years. So it's a multi. They're looking for a multi-level program. Um, and th these are things that I've been doing uh, apart from the Blender work and uh, my own work. So um, having a site online with free tutorials, multilingual, and supporting events and school projects. So um, yeah. On Facebook, you can see some more what kids have been making with uh, creating with Blender. So, this oh, sorry, that was there. Um, this actually leads to why on earth are we trying to teach 3D animation to school students? And many of you might have been learning this when you were in school, and many of you would have only found any sort of formal education by the time you got to university. So, the main driving forces behind why we're doing this, why we're teaching school age kids are listed here. I'm going to start from the bottom. So I started teaching this in 2007 because kids wanted to make the films that they were watching. And there's a huge social mobility issue here as well. In Britain, you pay a lot of money to go to university. So I was teaching in a sixth form college and letting children of, say, 14, 15, 16, 17 experience what it's like to create 3D animations allowed them to better choose the university that they, so the university course that they were going to go and study. So many students, you ask them, do you want to go and make games or do you want to make 3D movies? They say, yes, of course they do, because that's really exciting. It sounds really exciting. 
But when you actually give them the experience of doing that, many of them go, actually, this isn't for me. So you, you save them 9,000 pounds, about 9,000 euros a year, um, by giving them this experience really, really early on. And what else? Oh, sorry. Down there. So we've got films, games, motivating students, but we've also got some other stuff from there too. So we've got the idea that we want kids to be able to express themselves. And lots of children are doing 2D animation. Lots of children are using Flash, um, and lots of even do stickman animations, all that stop motion, all that sort of stuff is happening. So 3D seems like a very natural progression from that. And this is allowing kids to be creative in a format that they're very used to. They are consuming this all the time, but very rarely do we actually let them make it. And the other factor, which I found so exciting, so my main job is I train computer science teachers. And you've got this idea of computational thinking. So how do you make computers do things for you? And 3D animation is all about making computers bring your ideas to life. And very rarely in the world of computer science now, if you're teaching it in schools, do you get to, I say, humble the computer. The computer just does what you want to. So if you want to go and search through a million records, it doesn't take very long, maybe a second, two seconds. If you want to make an animation, all of a sudden your computer becomes something which is humbled by the task you're giving it. It takes a long time to do what you're trying to do with it. And you've got to think very computationally. You've got to think of, about ways of making the computer do things in clever ways, clever ways of solving problems. It's not just about, um, here's a computer, here's a task, done. They've got to start thinking computationally, breaking down tasks, abstracting tasks, little algorithms to go and solve things, to actually um, create the thing that they want to create. And that's, for me as a computer science educator, is very exciting. So. Um, hopefully, I've just made the case for why we're we teaching 3D animation. Um, and then, naturally, you move to why are we teaching Blender? Now, I'm preaching to the choir, we would say, because you guys are all, well, probably all of you, Blender users, or most of you Blender users. So you use Blender for whatever reason you want to use it. But there really is an important aspect, um, to picking, sorry, aspect of picking Blender um, above the other programs. And if I look at these things here, so here are some of your, um, your main programs that you could use to teach 3D animation in schools. And actually, the companies making these programs are very keen for them to be used in schools. And they provide student licenses. And you know, that's really good. So the fact that Blender's free, that's not such a big deal for schools. Okay? And it's not such a big deal for us teaching Blender. But there are other factors which make Blender so important in terms of teaching 3D animation. And you look at multi-platform, well, the other products, they work multi-platform as well, so that's not such a big deal either. But the fact is, you can run Blender from a USB stick. And we have run Blender from a USB stick um, across dozens of computers before. If you're a kid who at home doesn't have much access to a computer, it's not installed at school, you can get Blender on USB, you can go down your library or around your grounds, and you can run it there. So there's a huge social mobility issue here about how accessible Blender is. Look at the install sizes. I mean, you're probably aware of that as well. So you don't need to have um, even a modern computer to do this. I've been running it on some of the you know, really terrible, badly installed computers in schools. If you do any work with schools, you might find that the networks are really hard to install things on. Um, you can run it from a shared drive. You can run it from a USB stick. So we have a huge social mobility issue here as well. Now, you might find the, um, the commercial projects thing a bit weird. So why, why would a child um, at the age of 15 be you know, making commercial projects? Well, it happens. And we've had students making thousands of dollars through selling stuff online. If they were using the other products, well, the licenses, they're free for kids to use, but they can play around with them. They can't sell things. So we are enabling students who are very young to actually use a commercial tool to make money out of it. So they are starting to fund themselves. And we've got the full pipeline. So um, you're going to see in a second when we talk about the interface and how we teach the use of the interface. By swapping from one program to another program to another program to another program, you're going to find quickly that kids get very confused. Having one interface, the entire pipeline in one program, is really, really powerful if you want children to be developing films. If you want them to be modeling something, OK, just use a tool for modeling. That could be Blender, it could be something else. If you want them to make a film, every part of a film, you need to be talking about Blender, because the other products do not do this for you. You have to learn different things. And then I will leave you with the, the final one, which is students prefer it. 
you will have so many arguments about this. Oh, kids hate Blender. The interface is too complicated. We have the same conversation with kids using Maya, using Studio Max, using Modo. It doesn't matter. It really, for us, it seems to be what they start with. So kids preferring one thing over another, you know, it's, it really is, you're going to see in a second, how you teach it rather than something being more suited for children than something else. Okay. Exactly. Is Blender too difficult? I know there has been lots of remarks about this. Blender is way too difficult to learn. Uh, my experience? Well, no, it's not. Um, kids are able, or young students can handle complex software. They are able to manage the user interface as long as you tell them where to click and just focus on certain parts of the user interface. And it really depends on how you teach them. Don't do a 20 minutes video or uh, 10 actions in one minute because they go bizarre. They, they lose you after 10 seconds. And um, so it really depends on the way you teach Blender uh, to children. And we've done several events. Um, the list is even longer and getting longer and longer. And um, the nice thing is about uh, the Coda class. This year, uh, the first Dutch school started teaching Blender uh, to kids as part of a six-year program. So they started with 12-year-olds, and I received the question, oh, does Blender have a six-year-old, six-year uh, six multi-level program from 12 to 18, uh, 18? I was like, no, I don't know. <laughs> so we managed, together with Peter and Tom, to set up a, a program for the first year. So they're going to start in December. But you see, schools, and children moving on. They want to learn. And um, they've been creating amazing things, really. Button. So if we want to teach students to do this stuff, there's a question of what do we need to create? What do we need to be out there in the real world so they can get and do all of this? Um, now, obviously, they're the online tutorials. And we're going to sort of well, I'm going to um, point out some flaws of many of the online tutorials as they currently exist in a second. But we need the online tutorials so they can, they can learn for themselves, but we need to get them started. And so we need starter sessions. And these are really important if you want students using Blender because if they just go over there, they, they don't know Blender exists. If they go to the website, they download it, they're probably going to get stuck. And you need that thing to get them started, get the right mindset going. So that, that's really important. And once you've got the starter sessions going, you, you need to give them something bigger, something to really push them, to really get the ball rolling. And that's all the events. That's where 3D Ambi kind of stuff comes in. And you can also do after school clubs. Um, and the idea of a blending day, which is when you have like a one day um, event where students come along, they learn some of the blend and they move on again. So next slide. I have no idea why I'm doing this slide. It's enormous and really quite painful. Um, so this is sort of an attempt, and it's as much for reference after the talk as it is for um, during the talk, to go through and talk about essentially what's important if you're making a tutorial, an online video for the younger students. Um, most of the tutorials out there, they're fine if you're at university, but for you give them to a 10-year-old, not a chance giving it even to a 16-year-old, not a chance. So the first two points aren't really that interesting. Um, this is just common. If you're making a good, polished tutorial, and polish matters a lot more when you're dealing with young students because they don't have quite as much motivation. They're much more likely to quit and move on to another video. Um, and so you do need to just polish. Um, and yeah, edit, multiple takes, use a good mic, polish, and have a plan. Um, there's nothing more irritating for a 10-year-old, and the tutorial just goes off and mumbles about some unrelated concept for a while. But probably the most important point when it comes to beginners, and I say this point knowing full well that almost every beginner's video tutorial series makes this mistake, don't structure it like a reference book. A reference book is structured one chapter on the user interface, one chapter on 3D modeling, one chapter, you know, it's this very rigid structure, structure around projects. Students want to be doing something. They want to go in and learn just enough about the interface to use it. They want to learn just enough about modeling to use it. They want to learn just enough about lighting. 
and they do that project, and then you spiral around again, and then you teach them a little more with a second project, and so on and so forth. If you try and spend, and the example given there, because there's about five of these on the internet, um, a 20-minute intro to the interface, they don't watch it. They give up and they walk away before we even get to doing anything. And it doesn't achieve the goal you're after. Short, attention span of students is not great, but more so than that, you want to show them something and then have them do it immediately. If you show them lots of things, they'll remember the last thing if they do it immediately afterwards, but they forget the rest. You need to give them time to reinforce it. So five minute video, they do something. Five minute video, they do something. You'll see the structure in a second. There's um, a need for, in schools, subtitles. Headphones can be problematic in a school, particularly you can't have, you can't have in-ear headphones in a school. It's just not allowed because of hygiene. Um, students often have the phone, but not always. Um, so you do need to have subtitles. That, it's a silly little thing, but it actually matters. And it's also good for disability. Teachers can't ignore it. They're, they're teaching many, many students. They're making their teaching plan for all of their students if they've got one disabled student in there, not an option. Um, and it also just comes down to um, when you're dealing with younger students, once you reach university at age, you can sort of do English and everybody knows it well enough to go along. But um, for younger students, they need to be in their own language. So if you're just doing English, you're fine for UK, America, Australia, but everywhere else can't use your tutorials. Um, and then we can get on to even younger students. We're talking about the really young ones, 10, 12. And I think the youngest I've ever dealt with is six, which admittedly didn't work very well, but sort of worked. And you need to make them shorter. You need to have a written version because they may not want to watch a video. Um, and really slow it down. It means they just, they just can't fit in 10 concepts into a single video. It needs to be like one concept for the video. They practice it in the next video. One concept, move on. So, and yeah, repetition is on both lists. University student is self-motivated. You can say it once, and if they get stuck, they'll rewind the video and do it again. Many younger people don't think to do that. They, they get stuck and they try and keep going without it, or they just give up completely. So yeah, next slide, I believe this is. So here's, it's not very pretty, I'm afraid, but here's an example from what we've been working on. Now, this is uh, what is now becoming the famous party monkey. You're, you're dressing a monkey to go to a party. Okay, so you can probably tell there's Suzanne, there's the cone on top of Suzanne's head. Um, and we've got there, we've got the skills that they're going to cover. So very, it's a five minute video, or about five minutes. And the, all they're learning is how to add, delete, and move items. That's it. If you watch some of the intro videos, as Tom was saying, they, they might be 20 minutes telling you all these different concepts. This is a five minute video on how to add, delete, and move items. And at the end of that, the students can go on and do pretty much, um, you know, they can play around with adding, moving, um, and deleting objects. But they can make some pretty fancy stuff there. And I think you, if you wind back, you'll see a couple of them in some of Malik's slides. Um, so going back to the interface. Now, this is a big deal. It's been a big deal at these conferences for a couple of years now. Uh, everyone says the Blender interface is pretty terrible. Um, oh, you can't possibly learn how to use this. What we have done with these... Uh, with these tutorials is we've really focused on a couple of the very basic tools that they need to get started. And I've made, um, over here, I've just blown that up. We've got the, the move, the rotate, and the resize. And move, rotate, resize allows a student to create all sorts of things in Blender um, without learning a huge deal and actually without using any keyboard shortcuts as well. So we start off without keyboard shortcuts and slowly they appear, slowly they move in. Because getting a student using a mouse and the keyboard and the heads and looking at a tutorial, there's a lot going on there. So we stick with the mouse as an interface and we work our way up from that point. So um, what have I done? Well, this is the curriculum that I put together about two years ago. We got some funding from the Google Computer Science for High Schools to teach computational thinking through 3D animation. And this is freely available if you want to go and take it, translate it. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. And you can see some concepts there. I put them in red um, to make them quite obvious. Um, but what we've done, each one of those bullet points is a video. It's a four, three, four, five minute video. So the student will learn about moving and adding objects to take a monkey to a party. Okay, that's the first video. They've got a task there. They can go and do that, and then they can see how they get on. Then we learn about resizing objects to make trees. That's my um, very poor attempt at making a cube tree. 
Uh, then we've got about rotating objects. So you make a snowman. Well, if I want to get the, the nose on a snowman, I need to go and rotate something. Okay? Um, and then we're going to color in our snowman. So we, we're not using texturing material language just yet. We're talking about coloring in. And in the video, they can start to learn what those words mean. We're not going to scare them off. And modeling. So they can make a house, they can make a rocket. You're going to see an example in a second um, of a rocket which gets turned into a tent. Um, and then we go and animate our winter scene. And then we go um, render it out. Okay? So we've got... Well, it's actually eight videos there, but there's eight videos to step the students through the process of learning the very basics of Blender. And that's 40 minutes of film, and we normally cover that in about two to three hours. And at the end of it, I'm going to show you right now, this is what the sort of, sorry, the sort of stuff they're producing. So um, this is where it all goes a bit wrong. I'm going to have to go over here and hit the space bar, hopefully. Oh, no, that's not what I wanted. Uh, can you? There we go. So... Two to three hours learning the basics, or not working at all. <laughs> oh, no. OK, that's fine. Um, what can we do? So I am not a Mac person either. Can you help me out here? Apologies. Oh, well, let's, I'll try one more time. So you can see you've got the snowman in there. You've got the trees, but they're different trees. They're not the trees that I taught them how to make. They're trees that they've gone on to go and experiment with themselves. Um, they've made a road. We didn't teach that. But they've, by learning to move color things in, to delete, to add, they've got that working. So let's try one more time. It's very short videos. Here we go. Car reversing. Ooh. OK. So two to three hours work, but they've got the basics there. They're starting to create the creative stuff that they want to see working. Let's try the next one. Oops. It's going to work. Maybe not. OK, here we go. This is a bit more complicated. Ah, it's not what I wanted. Try again. There we go. So we've got some double surfaces there, a bit glitchy. And there's your rocket turned into a tent. OK? Same. We've got all these ideas. They're bringing it together, putting it in something that they want to make. So let's bring this to a close. Um, we have some resources already. And the resources are being used by hundreds, if it might be over a 1,000 now, but hundreds of children around Europe and beyond. We know that they work because. We've used them, and they work when we use them. But we do need them translating into some other languages. And as Monique said earlier, we have Dutch, we have English, we have German, German and no French. No. Any French people in here? People speak French? There's a volunteer straight over there. OK, so <laughs> what we have here is we have, we have resources. A lot of it's in text, so you can just do a, a straight text translation. We've got the videos. They just need another. Uh, kind of language track putting on them, and that will help us out. So, um, what else do we have? So, uh, we want more videos creating. So we've got a little set of ad advice there, which Tom took you through. If you follow that, you can start adding to this big collection of videos for very young children. Um, and we would love to see more events running. Depending on your country, you might have different things um, happening, a bit like Monique mentioned earlier. So, if you're interested in this, and you think you can run an event, um, get in contact and we can give you the resources, we can talk you how, through how it runs, and you can see some amazing things happening with children in your area. Um, personally, some of myself would love to see 3D AMI growing, so if you um, want to lose eight days of your summer holiday, um, we can teach you how to do that. Um, and we've also obviously got this Blender 101 user interface project, which is um, starting up, which Tom mentioned earlier. So there's, there's lots of stuff you could get involved with. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a meeting upstairs today at 3.30 for anybody who's interested or who just wants to find out a bit more and maybe even volunteer some time. And we've got three minutes left. OK. All right. Well, thank you very much. And we'll be around for questions at 3.30. OK.